Good afternoon and welcome to this segment of today's lecture. So we are going to continue from infection prevention and control. Infection prevention and control. The name once again is Samuel Donko Unkebo. Robert Koch believed and proved the germ theory of disease. You remember when we were doing the first aspect of microbiology, we said Louis Pasteur believed in the presence of microorganisms, but he could not prove the germ theory until Robert Koch came into the scene and was able to prove the germ theory using uh, the bacteria that causes anthrax, culturing them. All right, Robert Cox postulates forms the basis for determining that specific human diseases are caused by specific organisms. The ability of a microorganism to cause disease is known as pathogenicity. Pathogenicity. Pathogenic microbes have virulence factors. When we say virulence factor, what are we talking about? Virulence factors are special properties that enhance the ability of pathogenic microbes to cause diseases. So any factor that will improve or increase the ability of an organism to cause diseases in man is a virulence factor. Virulence is the degree of pathogenicity. Example, colonization and the ability to grow within host cells the ability to overcome immunity or host, of host, the ability to produce toxins, all these factors are virulence factors. Infectious diseases progress through contamination, colonization, infection, and then disease. So for an infectious disease to establish and to cause the real disease that it, it passes through these stages first of all you have to get the infection and then it progress through um, sorry it, it starts by contamination that is the organism contaminating the area or the part of the body it is going to get infected then it colonizes it and then it infect the area and the overt disease is shown all right, so let's look at infection and diseases. The differences or what is actually meant by infection and disease. Infection is the growth of microorganisms within the body of the host. But disease, on the other hand, is the disruption of normal body functions. So when we say a part of the body is infected, that part may be infected, but rather, but, but, but it is not a disease yet. So once microorganisms multiply or grow within a part of the body, we refer to that, pro that process as infection. Whereas disease means that the infection has actually gotten to the point that it has been able to disrupt a part of the body from performing its normal function. Half of all human diseases are caused by infections. All right, so let's look at what communicable or infectious diseases are. When we say infectious or communicable disease, what are we talking about? These are diseases that can be passed from one organism to the other by way of droplets, formites, or contact. Epidemiology of a disease, that is the study of the frequency and distribution of diseases and the factors which contribute to their spread. So when we say you are studying a disease or epidemiology of a disease, it means that the individual is studying how frequent the disease occurs, the distribution of the disease, which part of the country, which part of the world is this disease more common, and then what factors actually contribute to the spread of this disease. When you are studying these factors, you are actually doing what we call epidemiology. Endemic disease, when we say endemic disease, what are we talking about? These are diseases that are constantly present in a community. Epidemic disease, that is occurrence. So let me take the endemic again. Endemic disease is diseases that are constantly present in a community. So a disease that is almost always
present. For instance, if you take a place like, say, Ghana, uh, malaria is considered as an endemic disease because almost all the time you have people suffering from malaria. Epidemic disease. This is occurrence of diseases much more frequent than usual. So you may be having diseases, the specific disease around, but a particular time comes and then the disease explodes and becomes so frequent, a lot of people are getting it. So such a disease is referred to as an epidemic disease. Diseases that mostly occurs in epidemics in Ghana are cholera and the meningitis. Then pandemic disease. When we say pandemic, that is wide, worldwide spread or wide word, I'm talking about worldwide spread of a disease. So a disease that has spread worldwide is what we refer to as a pandemic. The, the, the latest example of such diseases is the coronavirus. Sporadic disease. This is disease that occur occasionally. So with this one, the disease occurs occasionally, one at a time. Let's look at patterns of disease. Specific characteristics that characterize diseases are called signs and symptoms. So somebody comes to the hospital and is presenting with meningitis. Another comes and is presenting with typhoid fever. There are manifestations or the things you will see and want to think that this one is suffering from meningitis are different from the things you will see and wanting to think that the other is suffering from typhoid fever. So these manifestations are what we refer to as signs and symptoms. So what is the difference between signs and then symptoms? Signs of a disease are observable through examination. So the things that you will see with your eyes or you will examine and be able to elicit them are what we call signs. Whereas symptoms can be observed and felt only by the patient. Examples of signs are if you take something like temperature, with temperature, when you check with a thermometer, you can see that the person's temperature is high. Okay? Vomiting. The person has vomited. You can see the vomit. The vomitus. That is a sign. Diarrhea. Maybe skin rashes. These are all signs. But somebody says, I have abdominal pain. With abdominal pain, you cannot see it. You can't do anything to elicit it. The only way you will know that the person is having abdominal pain is the by the person telling you somebody has headache. The person will only tell you before you get to know that he has headache. So that is a symptom. Combinations of signs and symptoms is referred to as syndrome. So when we say clinical syndromes, we are talking about both signs and symptoms. After effect of a disease is known as sequelae. So after a disease is controlled or treated, the possible complications that can come as a result of that disease is what we refer to as sequelae. Stages of an infectious disease. So what are the stages? If you get an infectious disease, what are the stages it goes through? We have incubation period to be the first one. That is the time between entry of microorganisms into the body and the onset of the symptoms. Organisms adapt and multiply to cause infection. So incubation period is a time between when the organism entered into your body until you start to manifest the signs and symptoms. If you remember when Corona came, we used to quarantine people for a period of time. That was about two weeks, like 14 days, simply because that was the incubation period of coronavirus. If coronavirus enters into your body, you will not start to show the signs and symptoms the same day, but it will take several days, like two weeks or 14 days. That is when you will start to show the signs and symptoms. So this period of 14 days is what referred to as incubation period. Prodromal stage. These are the first signs and symptoms or the stage. That is the stage that the first signs and symptoms of a disease which are non-specific occurs. At this point, the disease is highly communicable. At this stage, we are talking about at the point where the person got the disease and when the person starts to show the signs and symptoms. At this point, mostly the person shows signs that are not specifically related to the condition. So with this one, 
we refer to it as prodromal stage and we say this stage the person is very communicable he can easily transmit the disease to other people period of illness specific symptoms develop peak specific symptoms develop peak of signs and symptoms here what we are saying is that during period of illness that is when the person's i mean the specific signs and symptoms of the disease condition develops okay and a period of decline this is the convalescent stage where first signs of recovery appears and symptoms a bit then we have full recovery this is the end of disease syndrome and patient returns to full health types of infections primary infection this is an initial stage this is an initial infection in a previously healthy host so when we say somebody suffering from a primary infection it means that the person has been well until he or she got this disease and this is the first or the beginning part of the disease we call it primary infection so the person has never had that infection before okay then we have secondary infection this occurs due to depletion of host defenses by the primary infection so let's give an example like somebody suffering from hiv AIDS. the person had no disease condition at all but unfortunately got hiv AIDS. that is primary infection then unfortunately this hiv AIDS has suppressed the person's immunity because it has suppressed the person's immunity other conditions like gastroenteritis where the person is having diarrhea and vomiting like tuberculosis where the person catch tuberculosis and all of that these diseases start to come in simply because the person's immunity has been broken down by the first infection which is the hiv AIDS. so the first infection is the prime the primary infection is the hiv AIDS, and the other conditions that came as a result of the depletion of the immunity due to this primary infection are called the secondary infections acute infection these develop and complete their course rapidly okay so let's look at types of infections we have chronic infection which develops slowly and is less severe and lasts much more longer subacute infection this is an intermediate condition between acute and chronic infections then we have localized infections these affect a circumscribed area of the body then we have generalized infections these affect the entire systems of the body so with this one the signs and the symptoms or the disease part is not localized to a part of the body like say prostatitis where it is only the prostate gland that is infected but with this one it spreads to other parts of the body let's look at chain of infection this is a series of events that happen in order for an infection to occur for an infection to develop each link of the chain must be connected breaking any link of the chain can stop the transmission of the infections so we will be looking at the chain and like i said you need all the components of this chain to be present in order to ensure that an infection occurs so this is the chain of infection at the top middle we have the agent we have the reservoir we have the portal of exit we have the mode of transmission portal of entry and then we have the susceptible host okay so we'll be taking them one by one and see what exactly they are so i have the list here okay so let's look at the infectious agent the disease causing organism is known as the etiologic or the infectious agent examples of disease causing agents or infectious agents are bacteria viruses fungi protozoa and then chlamydia this is the agent that needs to be present to cause the infection or the disease then we go to the reservoir this is the source of an infectious agent reservoirs are places where the organism resides strives and reproduces examples of reservoirs are soil water air animals elevator 
elevator bottoms and then people so we are just mentioning areas where organisms can be harbored and then be transmitted from that part to other individuals for instance if you take water into consideration organisms like salmonella typhi the organism that causes typhoid fever could be in water so the water is harboring it it serves as the reservoir for it you drink the water and the organism enters into your stomach and then you start to develop typhoid fever humans are important reservoirs for pathogens carriers are infected individuals who spread the disease but they do not develop symptoms portal of exit the route by which microorganisms leaves the reservoir. So portal of exit is the route by which microorganisms leave the reservoir. Pathogens exit. Pathogens exit their reservoirs through one excretions and secretions, non-intact skins, re, I mean re, respiratory tract, GIT through vomiting and stooling. So when we say portal of exit, we are talking about the means by which a microorganism will leave its, its, its source or its reservoir. We are talking about portal of exit. That is the, the route by which an organism will exit its reservoir in order to get access to the other individual. Mode of transmission. This is the means by which the pathogen is transferred from the reservoir to a host. These include direct contact with skin or the mucous membranes. Example, shaking hands, casing, contact with wounds, sexual contact, poor hygienic habitats, habitats or habits. So these factors are means by which organisms can be transmitted from an infectious agent to a susceptible host. We also have indirect contacts which occur through fomites. What are fomites? Fomites are inanimate or non-living objects that carry the agent to the host. Example, stethoscope. So let's say um, nurses are at the nurses station and they all, they all use one stethoscope to check vital signs. So this nurse touches the stethoscope, checks somebody's vital signs. Unfortunately, the nurse was actually harboring some organisms like say coronavirus. He left the organism on the stethoscope. The next time another patient came, this nurse wasn't there. A new nurse took the stethoscope to check the person's vital signs. So, though the two nurses did not come in direct contact, the stethoscope has transmitted organisms from the first nurse to the second nurse. So, the stethoscope serves as a fomite. That is what we mean by fomites. Then, airborne, airborne, droplets. Aeros, drop, droplets, aerosols from coughing or sneezing can actually be transmitted from one person to another. Vectors. These are living carriers, or organisms, that carry the disease agent to the host. Examples are insects and then arthropods. So a very common vector that we all know is the mosquito. The female Anopheles mosquito. It is the one that carries the plasmodium parasites transmitted to people so it serves as a vector then we have portal of entry portal of entry this is the route by which pathogens enter a new host so the route by which an organism will enter into a new host this include the respiratory tract if you take coronavirus like this somebody is sitting somewhere sneezing and then another is breathing in so the organism got into you through the respiratory tract git skin genital urinary tract and then wounds gastrointestinal or fecal roots microorganisms enter the body through the same route they use to leave the body then we have the susceptible host susceptible host so a host is an organism that acts as a habitat for the growth of the pathogenic organism. Human beings who contract the pathogens are the hosts. Successful hosts are people that are at risk of the infection. So when we say a host, it is an organism which can actually get the, the sorry, it is an animal or organism or whatever 
a person who can actually acquire the, uh, the infectious agent and then the infectious agent can or cannot cause infection in him but the one that can actually get the infection as a result of getting the organism is called a susceptible host so people who are at risk of an infection are referred to as susceptible hosts Susceptible individuals include children, the aged, patients with chronic diseases, immunocompromised patients, malnourished, patients with burns, and then cytotoxic drugs, and then those who are on cytotoxic drugs. So we are looking at individuals whose immunity are not strong. If you take children, their immunity is not strong enough. If you take the aged, the immunity has been strong before, but because they are aging, the immunity is suppressing. Then patients with chronic diseases, of course, the immunity is suppressed. The immunocompromised individuals like people with HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, the immunity is already down. People who are malnourished, the immunity is down. When you have burns, it beats down your immunity. And then people who are on cytotoxic drugs, these cytotoxic drugs are toxic to your cells, and as a result of that, it compromises your immunity to some extent. Once your immunity is down, you stand a very high chance of getting diseases. Now, for we to stop the infection from happening, we need to break the chain of the infection. If you are able to break the chain of infection, if you are able to break the chain of infection, then we can stop the infection from happening. So, to break the chain of infection, you know, I showed you a chain making up of the agent all the way through uh, portal of exit, portal of entry, accessible host, and all of that. So you need to go to get to one point and then you break the chain at that level. Breaking the chain at the level of the agent, what do we do there? Correctly cleaning, disinfecting, or sterilizing items at or articles before use actually can break the chain true to, to, to for the infection to get to an agent let's take the next scenario that i gave that one nurse used a stethoscope and then another was supposed to use that same stethoscope if the second nurse correctly cleaned the stethoscope before using it or disinfected it before using it that new nurse or second nurse wouldn't have gotten the infection at this point you have broken the chain of the infection. Performing hand hygiene, antimicrobial therapy. So if you wash your hands adequately after you are done with the day's work from the hospital, you actually will not get the infection. In that case, you have broken the chain at the level of the agent. Okay. So let's look at breaking the chain at the portal of entry. Breaking the chain at the portal of entry. So for us to be able to break the chain of infection at the portal of entry, what do we want to do? We want to make sure that hand hygiene is maintained. You need to use sterile techniques for invasive procedures when exposing open wounds or handling dressings. Placing used disposable needles and syringes in puncture-resistant containers for disposal and then providing all clients with own personal care items or PPEs. Breaking the chain of infection at a successful host level. We want to maintain the integrity of the client's skin and mucous membranes. We want to ensure that the client receives a balanced diet, educating the public about the importance of immunizations, recognition of high-risk individuals, and then treatment. So, in order to prevent infection from happening at the level of the susceptible host, what do you want to do? Make sure you educate the person on the disease condition and educate them about the presence of immunizations. If the client is immunized, he or she is able to prevent the infection from happening to him or from occurring in him. But if the person is not immunized, the person is susceptible. Okay. Breaking the chain of infection at the host defenses level. The body's resistance to infection is determined by the state of its defensive and protective systems. The defensive system consists of innate immune system, which provide non-specific immunity 
an adaptive immune system which is an acquired response to specific pathogens so what we're saying here is that the body has gotten certain defenses that defend or protect it against infections this is divided into two we have the innate immune system which is non-specific it doesn't really segregate any infectious agent that comes in they resist the body the body resists against them through this innate immune system whereas the adaptive or the acquired immune system with this one um, there are certain specific infectious agents or diseases that this type of immunity resists against them not all disease conditions so we we'll take them one by one and see what exactly they are if you take the non-specific host defenses which is the innate immune system they include physical barriers like intact skin so if your skin is intact it does not segregate against microorganisms it protects you against all forms of microorganisms um, if you have intact cilia in your nostrils any form of microorganism that is trying to enter into your nostrils will be blocked by the cilia so it doesn't segregate among the types of microorganisms that enters then we have microbial barriers that is the normal flora so like i mentioned to you earlier on we have certain bacteria on your skin that is able to help you resist against microorganisms so an example of normal flora on the skin is staph aureus staphylococcus aureus is an organism are organisms that are found on your skin normally they wouldn't cause any infection on your skin but they will resist all pathogenic organisms that are trying to colonize the skin preventing it from infecting the skin then we have chemical defenses ph lysosome in tears and saliva so the body has gotten a medium ph medium to the level of you know ph is either acidic or base so the body's fluids has actually a level of ph which it maintains so for instance if you take the stomach like this we know that the stomach acids are highly acidic so whenever microorganisms are entering into the say git and they enter into the stomach because of the high level of the acidic high strength of the acid or ph in the stomach it kills the organisms unless maybe that organism is able to resist against acid so these are also classified as non-specific host defenses because it doesn't segregate among microorganisms then lysosome in tears and saliva these are also antibodies that are found in the tears and the saliva that protect the body against infectious agents other non-specific host defenses are neutrophils macrophages these also are non-specific produced by the body they engulf all forms of microorganisms and destroy them then fever this is another mechanism that the body adopt in order to eliminate or kill microorganisms out of the body and this does not different, differentiate or segregate among microorganisms they all know about the almighty inflammatory process or inflammatory response that the body does in order to fight against microorganisms then let's look at the second type which is the specific host defenses or the adaptive immune system the specific defense involves the immune system which responds to antigens so for the specific host defenses to occur an antigen antigen are proteins that actually causes diseases like bacteria or viruses or protozoa or fungi when they enter into the body then they will cause the body to be disease or infection so it is an antigen so when these antigens enters into the body the body produces antibodies against them this process makes the antigens the antibodies that were produced specifically related to these antigens when the antigens are killed off the antibodies remains in the body so that in the near future should the same type of microorganisms enter into the body again the body will activate these same antibodies again 
These antibodies cannot fight against any other form of antigen except the one that triggered their production. That is why we call them specific host defenses. The specific immune response is characterized by specificity, memory, and acquired ability to detect and eliminate foreign substances. So specificity means that they are specifically related or targeting a type of antigens or disease-causing organisms. Memory, they are, still, they are able to remember any time that organism enters into the body. Then, the immune response detects substances that are foreign to the body. The immune response comprises of antibody-mediated and cell-mediated immunity. These are, so we're going to look at um, what antigens are. So I'm saying that the immune response comprises of either antibody mediated or cell mediated immunity. Antigens. Antigens are foreign proteins which activate the immune response and react with the cells and chemicals to produce antibodies. So I've already told you what an antigen is. But antigens, remember that antigens causes diseases. So they are particles or proteins which when they enter into the body, they will cause a disease in the body. Okay? And whenever they enter into the body, because they want to cause a disease, the body is triggered and the body produces antibodies against antigens. So antibodies always goes against antigens. So what are antibodies? Antibodies are glycoproteins that are made in response to specific antigens and react with these antigens. Antibodies are immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins are the small immunoglobulins. So with immunoglobulins, we've, we've gotten different, different types of immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins basically are immune response agents that fight against antigens. And we have different, different types of immunoglobulins. So let's look at the first one, which is immunoglobin G. Immunoglobin G. Immunoglobin G are the smallest, but the most common antibody that is found in all body fluids and is important in fighting bacterial and viral infections and can cross the placenta in pregnancy to protect the fetus. So what we're saying is that immunoglobin G are the smallest among all the antibodies and it is found in all body fluids and it fights against bacteria and viruses whenever they enter into the body. And they even have the ability to cross the placenta during pregnancy to protect the fetus. Then we have immunoglobin E. They are found in the lungs, skin, and mucous membranes. And they are involved in allergic reactions. So immunoglobin E, see, look at the areas they are found. They are in the lungs, they are in the skin, and they are also in the mucous membranes. Anytime you develop an allergy against an allergen, Immunoglobin E is activated to react against them. Immunoglobin M. They are found in blood and lymphatic fluid and are the first type of antibody that is made in response to an infection and help in phagocytosis. So that is immunoglobin M for you. They are also found in specific places. Where are they? Blood and then lymphatic fluid. Whenever the body is infected, or is active the body any infectious agent enters into the body immunoglobin m is the first antibodies to be produced then we have immunoglobin a these are antibodies that are found in saliva tears and blood and they protect body surfaces that are exposed to outside foreign substances then of course the last one is immunoglobin d they are found in small amounts in the tissues that line the abdomen or chest. So look at it. They are found in small amounts in the tissues that line the abdomen or the chest. How they work, as we speak to you right now, scientists are unable to really specify. So that is immunoglobin D for you. Okay. So our next topic is nosocomial infections.
also referred to as hospital acquired infections. Nosocomial infections is the same as hospital acquired infections. So what is nosocomial infections? Infection that is acquired by patients as a result of medical care that is received from health facility which was not present on admission but acquired during the time of admission. Infection manifests itself 48 to 72 hours or more after admission or 30 days after discharge. So what we're saying is this person was suffering from a type of disease, got to the hospital so that he will get treated with that disease, let's say malaria. And then whilst he or she was in the hospital, within 48 to 72 hours, he started manifesting the signs and symptoms of another disease which he wasn't having. This disease is classified as a nosocomial infection. Let's say the person didn't manifest the signs and the symptoms of the disease, but got discharged from the hospital, and within 30 days that the person was on admission, the person develops the signs and symptoms of a specific disease. We still consider that disease to be a nosocomial infection. Common signs for nosocomial infections. These are urinary tract. So infections that can affect the urinary tract uh, through nosocomial infections can be through the following processes. Insertion of catheter into the urethra. Somebody has maybe BPH and because of that cannot urinate and you are passing catheter for the one. So in the process of passing catheter, you may end up introducing infectious agents into the urinary tract. This can lead to any form of urinary tract infection like urethritis, like cystitis, like prostatitis, and even pyelonephritis. Mm -hmm. So this means that the person actually got the urinary tract infection mm -hmm. through the process and that happened in the hospital. So it falls under nosocomial infection. Then frequent opening of drainage bag. Frequent opening of drainage bag. So you have a catheter passed in situ and urinary bag connected and then frequently you open it up and down, open it almost all the time, you stand a very high chance of introducing infection into the person's urinary system. Then improper positioning of the urine bag. These can contaminate the urine bag and this can lead to urinary tract infection. Then the respiratory tract. So you can get nosocomial infection through the respiratory tract by contaminated respiratory therapy equipment, example nebulizer, oxygen delivery tubes, etc. So in the process of nebulizing somebody who is suffering from, say, asthmatic attack, and you use a nebulizer, which was used by, you used it on another person, and you did not decontaminate it. So in the process, if that other person was having some other disease condition apart from the asthma, and infectious agents are on the nebulizer right now, you have transmitted it to the new patient. Then through the skin, you can get nosocomial infections through the skin by improper skin preparation before surgery. So you are preoperatively you are preparing the skin for a surgical procedure, and in the process you did not abide by the principles of uh, aseptic techniques. In this case, you are actually causing infection on the person's skin, and this is a form of nosocomial infection. The person, somebody can also get infections through infusions, like say IV infusions. How it can be infected? Use of contaminated fluids, contaminated giving sets, etc. Not covering the tip, touching the ends with your bare hands. So in the process of inserting your cannula in order to connect your fluids, if you do not use proper aseptic techniques, you stand a very high chance of introducing infections into the person and this is a nosocomial infection. Then people can also get infections through surgical procedures. That's nosocomial infections through surgical procedures. Poor aseptic techniques during incision and drainage. That's a surgical procedure. During chest tube insertion. That's a surgical procedure. During vaginal examination and during ear and eye irrigation. If you're doing all these things and you do not adopt proper aseptic techniques, you stand a very high chance of introducing infectious agents into the person. 
So this is a form of nosocomial infection. Let's look at effects of nosocomial infections on patients. Effects. So if people acquire nosocomial infections, it unfortunately prolonged their hospital stay. So the one who was supposed to stay for three days for the treatment of malaria. Unfortunately, the person has gotten um, rhinitis or the person has gotten influenza. And this influenza is going to need demand another four or five days of stay. So making it a total of say six or seven days, which initially was supposed to be three days. Patient stays longer than usual. It can also lead to long-term disability. That is depending on the type of infection. And then it can cause pain. Then it, it can increase resistance of microorganisms to antimicrobials. So the more the person is acquiring other infectious agents, the higher the chances of the person's infection resisting the antibiotics you are administering. It is also going to cause high cost of treatment for patients and their relatives and unnecessary deaths. So this person, if he was supposed to stay in a hospital for three days and every day he pays 100 CDs for admission, that would have been 300 CDs plus other fees. But this time around he's staying for seven days. So that's going to increase the bill to twice or more than twice the original. That's about 700 CDs plus other bills. Then it can even lead to unnecessary deaths. If the person had not come there to acquire the nosocomial infection, he wouldn't have died. But unfortunately, he came there, acquired pneumonia, and this led to his death. Then frustration and loss of trust in healthcare workers. So the person was not having the disease, unfortunately came there and developed the disease and stayed much more longer. The relatives may get to know that the person got a disease from the hospital. So they lose trust in the healthcare workers and they may become much more frustrated, may not even want to patronize your facility again. Let's look at impact or effects of nosocomial infections. It increases workload, definitely of course. If the client was supposed to go home in three days and he's now staying for seven days, that means that it's going to increase the workload of the nurses on duty and the doctors. Medical legal issues on the healthcare workers. So, relatives may sue, or patient and relatives may sue the hospital for negligence that led to the, pa the patient acquiring the nosocomial infection. Redundancy as a result of low patient attendance. So, a lot of people come there, they get nosocomial infections, they go and they don't come back again. They discourage their relatives from coming. What is going to happen? The hospital attendance is going to decrease and the managers of the hospital may decrease the number of staff. So they may sack some of the staff, leading to loss of work or redundancy. Then there is going to be massive additional financial burden for health systems. The more people fall sick, the higher the financial burden that it places on the health system in the country. How do you prevent nosocomial infections from occurring? From occurring, catheterization should be done when necessary. It means that if you don't need to catheterize, if it is not really necessary, don't do it. Daily catheter care. If a catheter is implanted, make sure catheter care is done on a daily basis. Remove catheter as soon as possible. Use aseptic techniques when passing catheter. Avoid frequent opening of drainage bags. Position your urine bag below level of bladder or hang drainage bags on the bed to avoid touching the floor. These will prevent them getting contaminated. You need to improve general hygienic practices at the hospital. Then you must avoid frequent flushing and irrigation of catheter unless absolutely necessary. Follow strict aseptic techniques when doing procedures. Use barrier nursing techniques in caring for immune compromised patients. So when you are immune compromised patients are those whose immunity is suppressed, like people suffering from chronic diseases or conditions like HIV.